We've all seen global brands missing the mark while trying to connect with consumers in various markets. There are some that get it right and become celebrated as understanding the culture. In this episode, I ask Sichaba Mudzielwa, Chartered Marketer and Board Member of the Marketing Association of South Africa, what does it take to get it right? How do you collaborate with your agency as a client with a global footprint to ensure that you connect with customers in any part of the world? It's like having a framework, but within that framework, having the flexibility to do what is right. So working with uh, local creative agencies, media agencies, any other agencies, uh, we are able then to find a way that will make the expression of the brand in the market to be relevant. He's also a forward-thinking marketing mind who has made massive strides at brands like SAB, Kimberly Clark, McDonald's, and others. We talk about the ever-evolving client-agency relationship with the rise of AI and customer-centric marketing. I don't necessarily look for agency for administrative tasks that can be automated. I'm looking for their thinking. I'm looking for um, their ability to connect at a human level my brand with with the market, and the market in this case is people. To help us grow, please subscribe and share this episode with your network. Welcome to the Lead Creative Podcast, where we talk to creative industry leaders, influencers, and brands. We discuss the strategies that influence brand thinking and shape industries. Thought leaders and heads of agencies let us in on some of their thinking and insights. I'm your host, Mongi Simtati. Enjoy the show and please share and subscribe. Shaba, thank you so much for making time to join us on The Lead Creative. What an honor to have you on. Thank you so much for having me on. Been looking forward to this conversation. Just to start, um, Shaba, growing up, what did you want to do for a living and how did you end up in marketing? I'm not sure if I had reflected on what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, but I yeah. ended up after uh, finishing school uh, doing uh, med- medicine at the University of Cape Town. And then after three years of struggle, I moved to the social sciences and that's where I found my mojo. I did business social, uh, did big Soxai, Bachelor of Social Science, and I did honors in industrial psychology. Um, and then when I started working at Stellenbosch Farmers Winery, I was a management trainee. So they rotated us between different departments, from HR to purchasing, sales. And then when I got to marketing, I found happiness. And then I said, I'm not no longer moving. Uh, and that's how <laughs> I ended up in marketing. Sounds like it was quite the journey. Uh, one will say so, uh, because I guess doing psychology, you deal, you deal a lot with uh, how humans process information, how they think, the emotions. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And of course, also if you have done anthropology and other social sciences, it all comes together. And then when you get to marketing, where you're trying to connect uh, brands, product and services or experiences with people, it just came naturally and I found that it was a good space for me. Now, as a marketer, And as creative people would sometimes have it, every now and again, you hear stories of that one turning point in a person's life, that one, you know, that one career move or piece of work that changed it all for them. Have you had that? And what was that one for you? Not not really. I've had uh, multiple opportunities to really work on amazing brands. Uh, some to bring them to the market, others to take them off the market, others to sustain, uh, others to to grow them. And through all those experiences, I've always found myself enjoying them. But obviously, when you become a marketing director for the first time, uh, you are really yeah. the apex of marketing making decision uh, pyramid. Then you are able to now have yes. full impact on what happens to the business and the brand. So one will say, uh, back in 2005, when I became marketing director for McDonald's, that will have been one of those moments where you say, I have arrived. I'm on the top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're still, you still making waves, and you're still making waves. Just 
Um, sticking with that a bit, just your work with multinational and global brands, there are some brands that have successfully embedded themselves in the communities and markets that they operate, whether be it multinational or global ones. From a brand owner and client perspective, how do you find this balance and how much of it is 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 can be done at a local level, especially if you're working with a global brand? I guess it also depends on the nature of that global brand. There are brands that are international and there are global brands. To me, international brands are brands that have got a presence outside of their home country. Global brands have a similar footprint regardless of where they are. So moving to a global brand with a global footprint, you have an understanding that uh, yours is to make sure that in the local context it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if it's for the golden yeah. arches, for example, you have to polish the golden arches, connect them to local culture, collect it to no local nuances, and make sure that you do give it that global feel. Uh, so it's never about localizing it, but it's more about how do you make a global brand relevant in the local context so that if somebody looks at it, it feels like it will feel whether you're in New York, you are in Tokyo, yes. or you are uh, in Morocco, uh, or here in South Africa, even in South Africa, sure. uh, whichever province you are in. As a marketer working on the ground within that sort of whatever local context that is, how much leeway do you have to innovate or even, you know, transform things or at least make them more, I mean, you've said it's not about localization, but locally or culturally relevant in a way that the brand and its messaging resonates to the people that it's, it's trying to reach? You know, you actually have quite a lot uh, because outside of your, you know, your brand guidelines as to what the brand can do or can't do, um, it's like having a framework that within that framework, having the flexibility to do what is right. So working with uh, local creative agencies, media agencies, any other agencies, uh, we are able then to find a way that will make the expression of the brand in the market to be relevant. Uh, so you have to rely on the creative guys, as I said, your media strategists, your retail mm. uh, uh, guys, to bring all those together to make it quite, quite relevant. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the South African context where drive-through at some point in time was not that used, it meant few people could use the drive through Majority of people still wanted to come to front counter. But over time, then you train people that the experience is possibly different and faster. And then obviously you have to make adjustment to that. And some of the adjustment just has to do with the products that you sell, some more than the other, which in the product mix can be quite different from, from the global brands. The other thing with uh, global brands is also the ability to to make sure that you, you make the brand sensitive to local cultures, things to do or not to do, yes. uh, even in the product themselves that you bring to market. So those things just make you, I guess, a marketer that makes sure the, mark, the brand works uh, in its local context. So I don't find it too big a challenge, um, but mm -hmm. there are sometimes when you have to, to do global brands. If you take a brand like McDonald's, for example, the I'm Loving It platform yes. was launched in 2003. It's still the same platform. You're not going to change it. And it's a long-term uh, journey to build uh, a brand as valuable as, as valuable as that. Uh, there are other brands that you see, your Red Bulls give you wings. It's been on that for quite a long time. But the expression yeah. of it becomes quite different. I can imagine. In South Africa, it could show the rugby guys, perhaps, if they were sponsoring the rugby yes. guys, or people doing paratliding, all the other things that we also do in South Africa. That's interesting. You, you've also mentioned something that I just want to go back to, this idea of global versus international brand. What's the, I think, what are the distinctions um, to you, or, or, or how do you differentiate them? I think for me, <clears throat> if you are in more than a hundred countries, you are pretty much covering the globe. If you are in about fifteen, right. you are international in the sense that you have a presence outside of your home country. 
But I also find mm-hmm. that a, a global brand has got global footprints. Like I say, it leaves very little room for local changes of the key things that make the brand, whether it's the name, uh, the, the, sure. the, the trademarks that that brand has. Mm-hmm. In some of the international brands, you'll find that in those other uh, countries that are not home countries, they still call a lot of room to localize, to bring on things just to make sure that they get a footprint before the control comes uh, to, to, to the center. So you still find the local guys having quite a big influence on how the brand is expressed, not necessarily just the influence on how the brand connects with the consumers. But globally, as I said, for global brands, the same campaign can be run, the same learnings, you can take somebody from this market and plunk them to another market. They will pretty much be able to be on the same uh, understanding of what needs to happen to the brand. And the training that you will get in a global brand is the same that somebody else sitting in Tokyo, or the US, or Brazil, or Argentina, or anywhere in the world is, will have. Some global and multinational brands have been with the same agencies sometimes for decades. And it may be said on the positive side that these partnerships are in place because they work. And some would say that the longer you are with an agency partner, the better the quality of the work because you know each other, or at least they, you, you are comfortable that they understand the brand. From a client perspective, What keeps advertising and marketing cutting edge for you? And do these long-standing relationships, um, are these these relationships worth changing at times or or, or why change what works? (laughs) Yeah. I think sometimes we trip ourselves there. We forget that relationships are between people. And people within Mm. the client environment as well as that agency environment usually rotate over that period of time. And the ability then to connect and make sure that uh, the ways of working that have made that partnership successful are carried forward. So there is usually a change of uh, personnel, um, teams, and also challenges that they have to solve over a period of time. So for as long as they are able to make the brand competitive and successful and continue to brand mm-hmm. to build a brand equity, um, it is fine. I think when you find that your ideas don't resonate with the competitors, the, with the consumers, your ideas uh, when ranked with uh, or compared to the other ideas are falling short, then you do have a challenge. But we will still find that the same brands, the same clients, uh, are all the same client and the same agencies win global awards that matter, whether it's for effectiveness or creative appeal. Uh, so when you find that it's still working, um, it is a good thing. Of course, so the opportunity cost of that is that you will never know if you were with a different partner, what that could actually mean. Um, and that's, I guess, the choice that you have. Where it becomes a challenge is when the work is not good, the, the outputs mm-hmm. are not good, but you somehow find that the client is not willing to shake things up and check how things should be. You must also remember that there is power in leveraging the scale of a global network of agencies. For example, as I said, when you're a global agency, you want to make sure that you can access the best ideas from anywhere in the world that can work where you are. So the ability to access those type of networks becomes quite key. And that's a good advice one should always give emerging agencies to say for as long as you are imaging outside of your hometown to town, sure. you think you have imaged, you haven't, because you are not mm-hmm. playing at a national as well as continental, as well as global level, because that's what clients sure. expect, especially today when the world is open through internet, the ability to, mm-hmm. to really show that your ideas are inspired by more than just where you come from, but where inspiration, cutting edge inspiration comes from. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. There are so many interesting things that you mentioned there that I, that I want to um, jump into. The first is this idea of, you know, multinational agency versus local or multinational versus emerging um, agency or 
being in versus emerging. Um, one of the things that I've been noticing in recent times with work that's coming out of emer agencies that could be seen as emerging is that I'm, I'm realizing how embedded they are in the local sort of culture, or I think they upsell how embedded they are in local culture and understanding local nuance in a way that they're able to translate, they are able to translate the messaging of a global brand to local cultural relevance. So from a client perspective, when you look at multinational, large, big agency versus emerging agency, do you consider this embeddedness in local culture and local nuance? I think, like I said, um, a brand expression is like local elections. They matter where they are at. In other words, in, yeah. in the context is, if I'm located in this particular community and my communication connects with that community and my agency sure. is able to do that tick, that is the correct one. Mm. I think... <clears throat> we always have to also remember that even within what we call local, it's nuanced. Local in Sentin sure. is very different from local in Alex, very different from local in Le Palapala or anywhere. Uh, so the ability, yes. I guess, to when you talk about local uh, is understanding that can you find the universal language that can really connect mm -hmm. to the target audience? Because sometimes... Right. Uh, the agencies or the people, the creatives that say they are connected to the local, the local culture, and they sure. connect to the local culture of the consumer, your targeted consumer. Right. So that then, mm -hmm. in that case, then it's 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 fine. But as I said, with agencies that also want to grow, agencies that want to make sure that they can go to where the client is globally, you will then st still find that they will have to find people in the local context in other countries that truly can do the work that we have just done. So you can't parachute them out of South Africa, for example, into Morocco mm -hmm. or into Brazil, and then you say they'll get it. But there's something that people yes. are able, if you are a too creative, to connect into the source of creativity, that genius that resides perhaps exclusively in creatives that they're able to bring it to life. Earlier, uh, when we spoke um, before this conversation, you mentioned how agencies sometimes tend to pitch ideas just for the sake of it, you know, while missing uh, some of the things that you as a client might be looking at or might be interested in. What can agencies do upfront to understand the brand enough to pitch ideas that are likely to be taken on? Because, of course, Pitching the wrong idea is a waste of time and money on the agency side as well as on your part as a client. Yeah, I guess if it's an open brief, an open brief usually then there will be a problem that's a little bit big and generic that has no clear solution, creative solution. So you open it up. But for your agencies, you write a very tight brief. I always say the power of the marketing director is lies in their ability to sign off very tight briefs so that when the marketing managers and the agencies work on that brief, it is not loose, mm -hmm. it's very clear. Because when you then judge the creative work that comes out, it's against the brief. So a good idea, sure. that's not on brief, it's, it's pointless. A good idea that I now have to find what can they solve in the business is also a waste of time. Yeah. And also a good idea does mm -hmm. not necessarily mean it's funny, does not necessarily mean it's clever. At the end of the day, as a client, I'm looking for ideas that solve the problem, whether it's a problem, a sales problem, yes. whatever the problem is. And if that idea, I believe, is the best one that can do that, then it's all good. This, you know, ideas keep coming up in our conversation time and time again. I think you've just mentioned now um, I think that, that the idea needs to solve a business problem, whatever that business problem is. You also mentioned earlier that um, when a creative person is able to connect to the source, which kind of talks to ideas as well, they, they are more effective as, as an agency to you. What does... I think what what are you looking at or where are you looking, I suppose, as a as a as a client to influence what to you is 
you know, are ideas that are, I suppose, can shift the needle for the brand? Sure. Look, a lot of the times an average, even an average creative person cannot tell you where their ideas come from, which is kind of silly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That they have a sure. career and they are putting their livelihood on generating ideas, but they become random and they can't even tell you where they come from. So from a client perspective is the ability to consistently come up with better ideas that are able, as I said, to address whatever the business challenge is. The other thing that is sure. becomes important is understanding the business of the brand or the business of the client so that then you can see to what extent you can move the needle. So, for example, if I'm saying at the moment I've got a challenge of attracting, let's just call it new consumers into the brand, then you have to find the research that says what is the problem? Are they going somewhere else? Um, what do you mean new consumers? Why do you want to attract new consumers? Being able then to understand that type of challenge and then saying who else out there is, being, is able to solve a similar problem? What are they doing mm -hmm. differently? And how can we do something unique for, for, for this particular client in delivering this solution? Remember something different for different sake. We are all different, but unique sure. means clearly identifiable and cannot be mm -hmm. mistaken for anything else. So most of the time, sure. you just find ideas that are different, but not truly yeah. unique. I mean, if I was to say to mm -hmm. you, um, Yebo Gogo, you will know which brand that was, yes. or the mere cat that was associated yes. with it. There are certain things that you will know that this particular one, they, they really got it. There are other brands who do sure. many, many funny things. We expect them to do. When there is an issue mm. that's happening that's political, they do funny things. But you don't actually remember those funny things. But you know that they'll do some funny yes. things. Yes. Whether they sell more yes. chicken or not, whether they sell more beggars or not, whether they get more engaged, one never knows. But what I do know is that you'll find that the ideas that are able to position the brand and build a brand over a long period of time, uh, when you see it, when you spot it, you will know. Out of this, one of the things that influences some of these ideas is the unique data or the data that you kind of have or the research that you have as you've, as you've referred to it. What I've been finding, or at least what I've observed over the past couple of years, call it 10 or more years, is that there were instances when the agency would have had access to a lot more data, a lot more unique data than the client. Increasingly, both clients and agencies almost tap into the same sort of data sources. In some instances, a client has a lot more data, like a global brand will have a lot more data because they sign up to all of these uh, subscriptions that provide data. How then does that help you and your agency or how do you then support your agency as a brand to come up with these great ideas based on this unique data, which in some instances they may not have, but you've got yeah, I think for me that's not a big challenge, isn't it? Because as leaders, most of the time we make our decisions with that available data, but we do know mm -hmm. the destination. Like a river humble in its beginning at its source, it knows its destination is the sea. How it gets there, which other rivers joins it, is neither here nor there. So it does actually get there. So you can be lost in all that data points sure. that we are talking about. You can be yeah. lost to distill it, to make, to make sure that you pull the, the insights and the data that's significant for your issue. In the academic world, uh, there's something called a literature review. Literature review is done so that you can locate your thinking amongst the authority within that body yes. of knowledge. And once you have located your voice, then you can express it knowing that you are not expressing it somewhere in a magical feeling but it's within the private yes. bodies. So even the data itself, mm -hmm. you need to know uh, what you are looking for and then how you'll then use yes. it to solve the problem that you have. Um, so yeah, having enough data does not necessarily mean there's an advantage. The ability to still yes. and use that data and connect it, uh, that's what actually makes it powerful. And the creative people are the ones that are able then to see an idea pop 
when they connect the different data points, to then say, these have never been combined in this way, we can do it quite differently. Uh, so mm. also, I'm one that says, one needs to continuously learn. Uh, there are new tools yes. of learning, there are new ways of aggregating information so that you are always knowledgeable. Uh, I mean, we can have another conversation at another point about where ideas come, come from. Suffice to say that yeah. the more, the broader your knowledge base that is diverse, the ability then to see multiple themes and the connections, you are, you are able to generate uh, more ideas. So it's when people become quite narrow, like we said earlier, to say, I'm, I'm closer to the local nuances. And that's just the yes, narrow yes. spectrum. When you bake a cake, mm. it should stay the same, the whole cake. Don't just eat the slice of the cake. So too many times we focus on the slice of the cake and not the whole cake. Yeah. These days, AI is being cited as a great tool that may replace some agency tasks to clients, or at least that's the perception. Um, why would you? as a client, still need an agency when you have AI? So it depends on when, when you say agency, what we mean. If I don't necessarily look for agency for uh, administrative tasks that can be automated. Sure. I'm looking mm -hmm. for their thinking. I'm looking for um, the ability to connect at a human level my brand with, mm. uh, with, 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 with the market. And the market in this case is people. So the agency, I'm still looking for creative people that are able to, to make those connections. And I think it's mm. a good thing that they are not bogged down on administrative stuff that can be uh, automated. It's almost like yes. if there's a car that I can drive to get to point A, point B, I can't argue that why should I not be working? It's automating yes. one part yeah. and then I can be able to automate. So I think it will actually give really, really good creative people the opportunity to mm -hmm to have time to produce a good work and not be bogged down with uh, administrative things that can be automated. How is it changing the client agency relationship in your view though, this increase in, 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 in automation and, and, and all of these things? Because like you say, it, 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 it improves, I think the administrative tasks, it automates some things that, uh, that we can automate uh, so that we then, you know, think outside of the box even more. Um, how how does it how is it changing the relationship? Are you finding that, for instance, you rely on your agency more for s strategy? You rely on how, how has it or how do you foresee that it 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 will change the relationship? I think that initially, perhaps at two level, uh, the first one will be that. All those administrative stuff that I spoke about, they will be more accurate and the reports can be generated quicker, budgets can be reconciled quicker. So there's, there's a bit of efficiency that is coming through there. That's one aspect. Mm. The other one, it does put quite a lot of pressure, as I said, for people to really, really get the good stuff out of the data. And there are, yes. there, are, there are tools that can sift through a whole lot of data while we are sleeping and generate insights and those connections, which then means then that your interpretation of what comes mm. through becomes quite key. And that's where the agency can play a much bigger role to actually say, this looks like Table Mountain, but you can use yes. a cable car to go on top of it. You can hike can get parachuted on it, depending on what they recommend is the best for you as a client to achieve your objective. Mm -hmm. But we're still looking at the same thing. Now it's around choosing the best way that will work to make us get to, uh, to, to the top. And I think the other one is where really, when you look at um, the AI and the, the perceived threat, it is still going to be people who are able to use it best to their advantage that will take the jobs from the ones who don't. So it's still people right. at the end of the day. So I will encourage everybody not to shy away from AI, but to embrace it and start on the journey. Some people are way ahead of us uh, because perhaps of the studies that they did. Some people because they're investing a lot of time in it. Uh, but let's all be on that journey and not stay behind because the world has changed. It's never going to go back to where uh, AI is not a factor in our lives. 
If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. Absolutely, absolutely. That makes sense. There's this constant dynamic among brands where they sometimes insource agency functions and there's a cycle when they sometimes outsource with the same brands. What causes this sort of tug of war between insourcing, outsourcing functions? And what are some of the advantages that you've seen in some of the agency functions that were that were done in the past, which you've now insourced to and you know and have gone through this journey? I think in my perspective, it's about where what are we call core competencies you want to, to lie. So there are times as a business where you want the core competencies to lie within the client environment. There are times when you want them to lie with the agencies because they are so far away from uh, from your core business. So if you take a brand that's on a digital journey, you want to make sure that the core competency of digital lies with you as a client. It becomes cheaper in the long term because... Um, and also you want to make sure that you can control and invest in the things that are core competencies. In, in this context, competencies, core competencies are those that give you significant advantage in the marketplace. Um, so you really want to make sure that as a client you own those because if they're owned by your agency and they walk away, you are in serious, serious trouble. And also that, right. that's, that's what happens. The other thing that one might sometimes want to do with uh, insourcing, outsourcing, as I said, is also when you want to, uh, to, to also infuse the skills broadly in the organization mm -hmm. uh, without yes. having to now uh, be charged an arm and a leg for it. And then once that competencies and skills have been infused, then you can take it out again. Sometimes it might be uh, so where you are in your growth journey as a as a, as a, as a business. Say, so for example, if retail at the moment is the area where you want to truly uh, accelerate your competitiveness, you may want to bring that much, much closer to you than leave it to a retail agency and just make sure that you're on top of it uh, all, all the time. Mm. Earlier on, you mentioned that one of the things that makes ideas really great or creative people really great is you know a diverse or diversified sort of knowledge or skill set where they are constantly are uh, researching different things and they understand and know different things which coming to this um, answer that you've just given me now which is a really great one I'm now wondering when you take on a team or you take on a group of people put them inside the put them inside the brand to elevate a certain core competency they stop being the people who are constantly seeing different ideas from different spaces within the agency spectrum how then do you keep that core competency and that team sharp when sharpness comes with the fact that i have four other clients that i'm looking at and i'm able to connect these dots from you know from financial services to retail from retail to 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 you know to motoring for instance and i see the lay of the land from a consumer perspective through all of these lenses how then do you keep that team that you're enabling to build that core competency sharp as a um, as a brand yeah it's not my role as an employer as a brand owner to do that it belongs to sure. the individual themselves remember in the past you actually had to physically work on a different client different clients at the moment Yes. access to information, you can go to YouTube, you can Google, you can go to all the other places to go in and get the knowledge and see what's happening, what's different uh, out there. There is a concept mm. of what we call a T-shaped individual, as in T, uh, the letter T. You can be broad and you can be deep in your knowledge. So at an agency level, it is possible that you will have that broad understanding if you have interfaces with different clients but not have sure. the depth of understanding one client's mm. business. So bringing them in, right. it might shorten their breath, but will definitely deepen um, how they understand the business. And then as I said, after some time, then they can dip out, but they will have been able to do that as part of just 
general growth of, uh, of people. That's why I said it, it, I have to throw it back to the individuals to say, how do you keep right. yourself competitive and relevant in what you say uh, you want to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in closing, Chaba, we have a tradition on the show where we ask our guests who they'd like to ask a question if they met that kind of person. And really the question is, if you could ask any question, um, rather, if you could ask any person in the world from any industry about their approach to marketing, creativity, and creative approach to work and life, who would that person be and what would you ask them? Dead or alive? Let's say alive. Say alive. Uh, And let's see. I guess it will always be um, the guys who have built some of the biggest brands uh, around, whether it's the Tesla guys, just to just find out to say, did you go out to build a brand or to build a business and the brand follows? Mm -hmm. That will be what I'll ask Elon Musk. Did you start by building a brand or building a business? And then see what was the thinking process and how the two are connecting or not connecting now. Because to be able to build a business of that size and that worth and then the brand that goes to it, there are some things that are special that might have happened uh, yes. either by accident or deliberately. And But I think it's significant to be able to have achieved that type of uh, milestone the size of the business and the brand. Thank you so much, Chava. That was, yeah, that was inspiring. Will, uh, you are the second person, by the way, to ask Elon Musk, to ask a question for Elon Musk. So uh, the Elon Musk questions, it looks like, will keep adding up. Thank you so much for, for making time. This was a really insightful conversation. Um, yeah, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners will find a lot of value in this. Hey, Mungesi, thank you so much for the time. It's always good to have these dialogues um, as a passionate professional in the branding, brands, building, marketing space, because of the influence that I have on people and humanity, it's always good to get a platform to once again uh, share the little that one has come across in their career. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Lead Creative. Did you get one insight that's worth sharing from this episode? Please share it with your network or your friends. Pop me some of your ideas and innovative finds on Twitter, on at Mongesi. This podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also find me on mongesi.com.